Hi everybody, welcome to lesson three and unit two. We're gonna be talking about community analysis and we're gonna go through items that are in the unit. This is probably gonna be a longer than normal lecture, so if you need to stop it and watch it in pieces, that's fine. So the first thing I wanna show you is what's here, this triangle. And what this triangle is, is it shows you where we are in the class. If you think back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about how we'll start out with a very broad basis and we're going to get more and more specific as the semester goes. So you're getting ready to finish your needs assessment, which is a national level. And our next step, we're going to be getting a little more specific because now you're going to have to have a community. So you're going to have to actually choose a state, a city, a neighborhood, a zip code, two or three zip codes, and that's what you're going to be working on. So the next thing we're going to look at is the PowerPoint. And then after the PowerPoint, we're going to come down and look at some of these other documents because you really need to work with those documents before we meet. So here is the community analysis. And what the community analysis does is it does exactly what your needs assessment did at a national level but now you need to choose a community. So we're gonna talk about how to get community data. So as you see on the slide, community analysis, what we're gonna be doing is looking at research and analysis of community assets and challenges. Um, we're looking for information that's gonna help us plan and we can see what kind of opportunities and needs exist in the community. We're also going to look at the norms and shared beliefs. So, for example, in some ethnic groups, um, health care providers are not trusted because of the history of what's happened. So if you're working with a population that doesn't trust health care providers, you need to understand that that's the norm in the community and you need to work around that. You can't just go in and assume everyone believes what you believe. And finally, when we're doing this, we're, gonna, we're actually looking at improving the quality of life of the community. And if you think about the pre c pro -C model, that is where we started at the very end, and we're always trying to improve quality of life. And your goals and your grants do that as well. Sorry about that. So in your needs assessment, we only collected secondary data. And secondary data are those data that someone else has collected. So when you're reading articles or you're going to websites, all of that is examples of secondary data. But in this case, once you pick a community, it is highly unlikely that you're going to find a journal article that's peer-reviewed that is, that is about your specific community. So all of a sudden, we need different type of data. So your secondary data here is going to come from community sites like the health departments. Um, uh, if you go to CDC, they often have data on specific zip codes or areas. So your secondary data has to be very specific to your population or community. But even then, in real life, you're not going to have everything you need. So we're going to look at ways to collect primary data. In the real world, you would collect primary data, but you're doing grants from all over the country, and we're not going to send you anywhere, and because of the, we're just not sending you anywhere. So this primary data that we talk about, this is going to be something you write about, and you would explain what you would do if you had the opportunity. So here's primary data. Primary data are those data collected for a very specific reason. So in this case, you would be collecting very specific data on your population as it relates to your grant. These are some examples, and we're going to talk about different ways to collect primary data. And the benefit of primary data is that it is related to exactly what you need to know. Whereas the secondary data sometimes is about a whole bunch of stuff, and you have to find what you want to know. But because it's so specific and because you're doing it yourself, it's very time consuming and it's much more expensive than going and finding articles or websites. So these are some examples of how to collect primary data. The first one is a focus group. And there's also reading material in this unit that you can that will help you go over these things. So the first one is a focus group. 
So a focus group is usually a group of maybe 10 people, five to 10 people, and they are experts and they're experts on something. So if, it, if you wanna find out information about your community, the experts are most likely from your community. And you need to start to think about who the experts are. If you're doing um, a grant that is in rural areas, then who would be the experts that you would have on this focus group? The benefit of focus groups is you get to talk to a variety of people at one time, and sometimes they're able to help each other remember different things that, oh yes, I remember that happened to me. So it's very specific, um, and people are paid when they're in a focus group. And um, I would, the, my measurement, and it's a silly measurement, but it's my measurement. A long time ago, I was on a focus group and I think I was paid $25, maybe 50, but I'm thinking it was $25. And it was enough money that I could go buy a dozen of steam crabs. So whatever, this is my theory, whatever a dozen of steam crabs cost, that's approximately what you would pay people to be on your focus group. And a focus group usually lasts maybe 60 or 90 minutes. You're asking questions and they're answering them and you're either recording them auditorily or you have a note taker there or both. But what's gonna happen is everything they say will be transcribed. Um, the next thing you can do, which is to the right, is an interview. And an interview is interesting because in an interview, you might ask the same questions as a focus group, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. So it takes longer to do, like if you talk to 10 people in a focus group, that's gonna take 90 minutes. But if you spend 45 minutes with 10 people, that's a lot more time. But there's benefits of talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, for example, if you were doing a topic that was very sensitive, maybe you would be concerned that people wouldn't share their real opinions in front of their peers. So that's an example of when you would do interviews. Okay, so that's an interview. I don't always go in the exact order of what I'm doing here. So an interview is one-on-one. -on -one. A survey or questionnaire could actually be done one-on-one, -on -one, or it could be done via the internet, or it could be done regular mail. So if you do it, the, the thing I always talk about with surveys are when somebody is chasing you down in a shopping center trying to get you to answer questions. So that would be an example of how it could be face-to-face. -face. You also might knock on people's doors and see if they would answer your survey. And so there's an issue with that, and I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about what might an issue be if you were knocking on people's doors to do interviews. So for example, and I don't know if you've thought of anything yet, I only answer my door if I'm expecting someone. So if someone is knocking at my door and my dog starts barking, I don't get up because if I didn't invite you to my house, why would I open the door to talk to you? So sometimes people are not going to want to talk to you on an interview basis one-on-one. -on -one. If you go through the mail process, the U.S. mail, I'll give you five seconds to stop and think about what are some problems that might happen with the U.S. mail. So there's a variety of issues with U.S. mail. One is um, the amount of return you get. Usually you get five to 10, 10% is actually really high, but you usually get around 5% return, which means if you sent out 5,000 mailers and you, you would expect to maybe get back 250. So it's a lot of work for not getting a lot of response. And the other problem with mail is Nowadays, because we have other ways of communicating, surveys, when they come in the mail, sometimes they just go in the trash. So what I actually do with my mail is I stand at the recycling bin and anything I don't know what it is, it goes in recycling. If it looks important, I open it and usually goes in recycling afterwards. Or the only mail I really pay any attention to are things that I'm expecting to come to me, bills, um, if, if it's my birthday and somebody's sending a birthday card, 
those are the kind of things I open. Pretty much everything else goes in the trash. So as we've become more accustomed to electronic communication, we've become less likely to read paper mail. So the other way to do this is through electronic systems. And I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to think about some problems that might exist using an electronic system to get a survey completed. So if you send something electronically through the email, you do face a similar situation where people just throw it away. So my email is set up, I have Gmail, and it is set up so that anything that's marketing, like sales, things like that, some, that my computer doesn't recognize, that goes into a marketing folder. Anything that's social marketing goes into a social marketing folder, and anything that doesn't fit one of those just comes to my general mail. Well, unless, some, unless I'm looking for something to come that hasn't come, I don't typically read anything in those other folders. I just delete them. And then when I get to my mail that's come to me, if I get emails from people and I don't know who they are and it just looks craziness, I just delete them. So you would have the same potential problem of people deleting them. Another problem with electronic um, methods of getting surveys is that sometimes people don't have access to internet and if you're deal dealing with rural communities it is possible or likely that your community does not have internet access so at that point it would be you wouldn't you wouldn't just get it done um, so the you could also refer you could also use a telephone survey questionnaire um, again I don't answer my phone if I don't recognize the number. So things are a lot different nowadays than they were 20 or 30 years ago. So the next one I'm going to go over is community forum. And a community forum is when you go to a meeting that's already occurring and you piggyback on that meeting. So in a focus group, I have 10 people, max. But a community forum could have two people show up or it could have 50 people show up. So you don't know how many people are coming because you're not in charge of the meeting and they don't get paid to come. They're just coming to some kind of community meeting, church meeting, rec council meeting. There's a meeting that's already happening. So if there are 50 people there and you're gonna ask questions and try to get feedback, it's a lot more difficult to control a crowd of 50 than it is to work with a, a group of 10 or five. So that's one of the more difficult things about community forum. It is easier to do because the meeting's already set up, but the lack of your control over it um, can be detrimental to what you're trying to do based on the number of people who are there, whether they're happy or not, um, what's happening at the meeting before you talk. So those are all things that would affect you. Next, I'm going to talk about photo novella, and photo novella has changed a little bit. Actually, it's changed quite a bit. Um, in the old days, you would get disposable cameras and give them out, and my last check, there are still disposable cameras. So you could go out and get disposable cameras and give them to people, and you ask them to go out and take photographs of their neighborhood, and you give them some guidance like, you know, take photographs of the places where people go the most or take photographs of the places that you feel are problematic in your community. And so you give that to maybe 10 or 12 people and you send them out to take photographs. They come back, they give you the disposable camera and you have the film developed and then you go from there. There are ways to do this digitally. There are phones that you can get that are limited in what they can do um, so that people don't just take them and keep them. But you could also do this electronically with uh, cell phones or tablets. And again, you can limit, you can lock down a tablet or a phone that nothing can be done on it except what you use it for. So you could give people tablets or um, phones and ask them to go out and take photographs of the same things. Everybody brings them back. And now you don't have to have them developed because they're already there digitally. And what happens is whether it's on paper photos or whether it's a digital photo, when you pull all these different people's photos together, you will see patterns 
a lot of the things that they take photographs will be the same. So when that happens, then you realize that there are patterns and there are special issues in the community, or there are special assets in the community based on the photographs that they've taken. So that's photo novella. Next, I'm gonna do windshield tours. And a windshield tour is exactly what it sounds like. You're behind the windshield, so you're in a vehicle and you're going on a tour. Sometimes people will do walking tours, but usually they do windshield tours because um, it's less intrusive to the community. So when you do a windshield tour, you need an expert from the community to go with you. And so um, when I was an assistant principal, my principal and I were sent to a school to clean, it, to clean up what was going on there to terminate people and get people on track for student success. And what the first thing my principal did, and I didn't realize how important it was until much later, the first thing he did was he set up windshield tours, and he called them neighborhood tours. And he had someone in the neighborhood go around with us and tell us about the neighborhoods. So we had three distinct neighborhoods that fed our school. We had three distinct windshield tours. And the expert for each one of those tours was different because it was somebody from the community or somebody that knew the community. So the benefit of that is they get to, you'll take, they'll take you around and if you don't know the community, you will learn a lot about the community and the people who live there when you go on a windshield tour. Next are observations and observations occur when you're observing behavior. And so typically when you're observing behavior, you don't want people to know because if they know you're observing behavior, they behave differently. So I'm gonna give you an example of one of our interns and what they did as part of their project, and it's an observation. So what they did, their supervisor wanted them to figure out um, how to get people to eat healthier foods at the college cafeteria. So before they developed an extensive program, she spent, this intern spent a week in the cafeteria at lunchtime. She would go in with her lunch so it looked like she was there to eat, and it looked like maybe she was doing homework. And she sat close enough to the registers that she could see what people purchased. And so while we're not in class to talk about it, what do you think, I'll pause for a few seconds again, what do you think were the number one things that people bought at the college cafeteria? So pretty much what they bought mostly was french fries and pizza. So that was one of the things they walked away with seeing what they purchased, but something else happened while she was doing her observation. And that is that most of the unhealthy food that they purchased was purchased at the register. So rather than building an extensive program, they decided to address policy. And what they did was they took all the unhealthy choices away from the register and they put healthy choices at the register. And just by putting healthy choices at the register, it addressed one of the major health needs on campus. So observations can be really powerful in the kind of information you gather. Again, you need to be, um, you can't be obvious when what you're observing. You need to blend in. And the other thing is not everything can be observed. If you wanted to know if people were using condoms every time they had sex, you certainly should not be observing them while they're having sex. Or, or if you wanted to know if a woman did breast self-exam, you can't observe that. It would be wrong to put a camera in her bathroom to see if she examines her breath, breasts monthly. So observation does not always work, but it does work sometimes. Next is skills assessment, and skills assessment, what that is, is it is a, a way for you to assess someone's skills, and that happens a lot in our field. And I'm just gonna give you one example that you all should be relatively easy to relate to, and that is CPR. When you take CPR, there's a checklist of skills that you have to do, and you have to do them in a certain order. So no matter who's watching you do those skills, no matter which teacher it is, they are all using the same checklist. So if you wanna do a skills check in your grant, when you're collecting primary data on your community, then it would be appropriate to have a documented list of everything, the step-by-step -step that you want them to do. 
sometimes there might be 12 steps listed, but there might be one that's critical. Um, and so if they miss the critical one, that's a really big deal. But if they miss two or three of the small ones, it's not. So the skills checklist is very important, um, but it's used for very specific reasons. And the last example of primary data that I'm going to go over is document review. And this is kind of a gray area because sometimes in a document review, it's, you're looking at secondary data. So maybe you ask the hospital to pull up discharge records and you're looking at just one specific item and, it, and maybe you're looking at how many people go back to the emergency room within three months of being discharged. So that, that data already exists, so it looks secondary, but because you're pulling very specific data out for what you need, it's considered primary data. So these are most of the ways that people conduct primary data. And if you wanted to pause the presentation, this would be a good time to pause because when we go to the next slide, we're going to be getting into something slightly different. So now we're going to go on to secondary data. And secondary data are collected for general information purposes. And so if you read an, a peer-reviewed article on heart disease, there's probably data in there that's been collected. And it's not necessarily specific to your population or your community, but it's just data that already exists. So sometimes you get your data from experts. You might get them from information sources. For us in our class and in our field, you would typically be getting them from websites that would be websites that end in edu, that end in gov for government, or end in org for organization. You should not be getting, uh, you should not be using websites overall that don't end in one of those three things. So secondary data is much less expensive because you're not doing it yourself. And it's also a lot more accessible because it already exists. The problem with secondary data are they do not always meet the needs of the researcher or the person writing the grant like primary data do. So next in considering the types of data, there's two main types of data, qualitative data and quantitative data. And qualitative data usually involves words or images and so, for example, when you do a focus group and you're recording everything they're saying or you're doing an interview and you're recording what they're saying, that's just, those are examples of qualitative data because you're gathering words of what people say. And as the, when the interviews or focus groups are over, when you go back and you look at them and you code them, there will be themes that come out. Just like when I said photo novella, if 10 people go out in the community, and you ask them to take photographs of places where people join for positive reasons, there's going to be themes that develop. So those are all examples of qualitative data. They're very important. They give you a depth of understanding that you do not get with quantitative data. Quantitative data usually exists um, with nu nu uh, numerical values or numbers. So if you do an interview, and you ask questions, for example, are you male or female? Um, what age are you? And then you ask questions like, do you agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, disagree? You can put number values on all of those items, and then you end up that where you have numerical data that you can actually do statistical analysis. So a lot of times people believe this statistics Statistical analysis of quantitative data are more powerful data, but in reality, it's just very different. It's very powerful data, but you won't get the kind of depth that you'll get with qualitative data. So depending on what you want to do, that will determine whether you use one or the other or both. So I brought this up when we're evaluating data sources. So we're going to talk about data sources in general. Some of this has to do with websites and some of it has to do with articles. So one of the first things you should ask yourself is who is the author? And I will look at some of this stuff. If you, 
when you turn in articles or your APA lists or um, annotated bibliographies, I do read most of the things that you um, submit. So if something is very strange in the article, I always look up the author and all you have to do is Google people. Um, you can Google the person, you can put them in LinkedIn. Um, there's all kind of ways you can Google people to find out what their background is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a website. And the website um, is, is about suicide, but when you go to the website, there's a lot more health information there. So, um, and I've had students use this website often, but it doesn't end, <coughs> excuse me, it does not end in .com, .edu, or .gov. So because it doesn't end in any of those three, it's suspicious. So I went to the web page. I clicked on the main part of the web page, and there's usually a list of who's in charge. And so when I looked up who's in charge, what happened was it's a, a husband and wife whose daughter committed suicide, and they started this web page. And from there, somehow it's about nutrition and diet and mental health and stress and sexuality, all kind of topics. But their only background in the health field is their experience that their daughter committed suicide. So that, that questions what they might write. Another example is sometimes there's a caffeine site that comes up. And again, it doesn't end in .gov, .edu, or .org. So I look it up, I check the person who's in charge of the website, and he's a biology teacher. That's his background. I've looked, up, I've looked up health websites that people are using where somebody has a degree in journalism. So you really need to be careful if you're using a website that is not .org, .gov, or .edu. And for authors, sometimes you need to be careful too. Often they'll tell you who the author is. But when you start going to sites where there's literature that's not peer-reviewed, um, and you are going to come across those sites, sometimes you need to do a little bit of research. If you don't research your author, I will, and I'll let you know. So I've just mentioned the peer-reviewed. Is it reviewed by peers? Is it reviewed for, by um, experts? And if it is, that's helpful. If not, and somebody with a degree in journalism is writing about mental health, that is not very valuable information because they're, they're not experts. How old is the information? This came up when you were starting with your library searches and we talked about it. There's times, for example, if you were to look at the main causes of heart disease, there has been very little change in the last 25 years. If you were to look at the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease, there have been vast differences. Um, so, same way with cancer, same way with diabetes or asthma or suicide there's going to be some things about your disease or condition in your grant that you might be able to use an article or a book that's 25 years old but there's going to be other parts of it where you really need more current information and as you're turning in your outlines and your annotated bibliographies i will give you feedback on that i will tell you if something is too old and how to get more recent information the next item on the slide is, was the information in your article put together for public use or commercial? So for example, if Johnson & Johnson does research on Tylenol, which I think Johnson & Johnson makes Tylenol, if they did research on Tylenol and made an article on their research and the research showed that people should buy Tylenol, that's questionable. So you have to really look at who's paying for the research, how's it being done, is it commercial, like what I just explained. Uh, you know, if uh, Red Bull does research on energy drinks and finds out that, the, that there's positive things about drinking all that caffeine, you'd have to question that because they have a, benef they get, have a, a direct benefit of finding out what they're reporting. And then, who's the intended audience? So, if I go back to that website about suicide, 
if you were using that website because it was a blog and you wanted to talk about how people feel when they lose someone to suicide and that was the purpose and that was the way you were using it, that makes sense. If you were using it as a medical expert type article or, or resource, that does not make sense. So you really need to look at who the audience is for what you're reading. And that that's usually pretty easy to figure out. Okay, so in the real world, if we were actually gonna do primary data collection, there's ethics and confidentiality issues that need to be followed. And so as the person collecting the data, you have obligations to the participants. So we, no matter where you work, whether it's a university or an organization, a hospital, a college, whatever, everybody has standards that you have to meet if you're gonna collect data from people. So you have to be aware of those. Um, and when, let's see. And I think I've said everything on here. It's your job to, to safeguard or protect the participants. So these are some ways to protect participants. One is um, to not force people to participate. And so um, if your hospital, for example, is in a poor community and you want to test a new drug, and you go out into the community and you tell them that you will pay them $300 a day if they'll take this medication. Is that participatory? Are they volunteering? Or if I go to a college campus where I know people don't have a lot of money and I say, hey, if you take this new drug, and this medication that we're trying to test, if you take this, um, we'll give you $200 a day for this month. That's a lot of money. Is that volunteering? And the answer is no, that is not voluntary. If you're taking advantage of a specific community and you, there, there's almost no way for them to say no because the value of what you're giving them, that's not considered volunteering. So if you wanted to use the community near you, you would have to then also seek out other communities. And there are hospitals that are major respected hospitals in the world who have been reprimanded from the federal government because of doing what I just explained um, to the point where they've almost lost all their federal grants because of how they're treating the community and how they're using them like guinea pigs and that's not acceptable. So you have to guarantee that people are not going to be harmed um, and that they're not going to lose their confidential information. You need to protect identity of participants. You need to be very careful that the data that you're collecting cannot then be attached to their name in any way. And that means you really can't talk about things in a public place. So you might be, you might be in a hallway and not realize that somebody around the corner can hear you and you may connect data to a person. And that's not acceptable. So let's look at the components of a community analysis. So these are there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can collect data on your community and that's what we're going to be going over at this point none of them are going to be used for everything you're not going to use all of them you're going to have to look at your community what you need to find out and what what relates to you so one thing you can look at is the current conditions and you can do that through a windshield tour you can look at crime data you can look at poverty data and that gives you an indication of the current conditions in the community you can look at significant issues that the com that the community is facing in the next several years, or you could look back <clears throat> on the last several years. And so that's important also because that will tell you if a community has had something extremely negative happen within the community and they have survived and they're strong, that means it's a resilient community. But if you take the community where the Freddie Gray incident occurred, that community has had a tremendous amount of negative things happen in it, and it is struggling. It doesn't have a lot of services. And even though people are trying to come back from it, there's so much negative um, input into that community from people outside the community that it's very hard there to survive. And it's an area that a lot of people have interest in because of that. All right, next one. 
So you need to be able to describe the characteristics of your population or community. So what are the zip codes? What are the race and ethnic makeup? Male, female makeup, age makeup, um, poverty. You need to be able to just to describe your population. So when you're describing your population and someone reads what you've written, they should be able to in their head envision what your population looks like. Um, economic stability, which is if you did, you know, at various points in time, sometimes the economic stability is good, sometimes it's not. In poverty-stricken neighborhoods, economic stability is often difficult because it's a vicious cycle. Sometimes in poverty-stricken neighborhoods, there's a lot of crime. And if there's a lot of crime, no businesses want to be there because they lose too much in theft. So then nobody wants to be there, so then it's more difficult for them to get to services. So it's very interesting, but economic stability is a very important issue when you're looking at, when you're trying to describe your community. Quality of life, this, you know, just are there parks, are there open space? Is, is there a positivity in the community? Are there places where people go to gather and meet? Is there social interaction? Those are all examples of things that would be a high quality of life. Resiliency, I've already talked about. If a community can back, bounce back from adversity. And then community values, I've mentioned a little bit earlier. And that is, what are the attitudes of... Um, of the community about a variety of things. What are their attitudes about change? What are their attitudes about business? What are their attitudes about healthcare? Those are all community values that you need to know. Um, if you're doing an overall community uh, assessment, you would look at retail sector and infrastructure analysis, and you may or may not do those in your grant. They, they are indicative of things you might discuss, but they're not typically discussed. But for example, if you don't have a lot of retail sector in your community, and you, one of those retail sectors is grocery stores, and people cannot get to fresh fruits and vegetables, that is an example of retail sector that could affect your topic. Infrastructure is um, what's behind the scenes that allows things to happen. And that, that could actually be in a grant. So for example, if there are not a lot of places to have safe exercise or there's not a lot of transportation set up in a community or let's i'm going to stick with transportation if there's not a lot of transportation set up in a community and people do not have cars the infrastructure there is questionable because a business is not going to want to go there it's going to be harder for them to get to health care so the, that's an example of how infrastructure could work in your topics. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at two different models briefly here, and then we're going to go over them in more detail in a different slideshow. So the first one is PATCH, and PATCH stands for Planned Approach to Community Health. And if you're doing your health program correctly, you're going to hit these, these um, elements. So these are the five elements of PATCH. Um, for you see in the very beginning, the community members mu must participate in the process. Go back to that online assignment this week or last week, and you will see that, again, we're repeating, the community must be part of the process. You need to use data to guide your program ideas. So as you're collecting data nationally and locally, are your data that you're collecting actually helping you? Um, the next one, do participants develop a comprehensive health promotion strategy? And what that means is if you're doing a grant for heart disease, your program should not only address heart disease. It should address the total person. If you're doing a, a grant on asthma, it should not just address asthma. It should address the environment, the community, the family, um, society. So they don't, grants are not written anymore that it's just for one area. When you really read your grants, it's much bigger than one small piece. Um, getting evaluation and feedback, which we will do as the semester continues. And then what is the capacity for, the health, for health um, with this program? So the goal is that when the funding ends and the grant goes away, will you have built enough capacity in that community that the program that you put into place could stay.
So if I build a program, the whole time I'm building and developing a program for a community, I should be developing capacity. I should be building human resources. I should be building um, structural um, pieces. Like, is there enough equipment? You know, how are they going to continue to get new equipment when this grant's over? So you want to be, you want to actually be creating capacity for the program to last after you leave. Oops, sorry about that. These are the five phases of patch, and you can read those on your own. And we're definitely doing these. And then the other one is map or map it, and people get the two mixed up, so I've sort of combined them here. And map stands for mobilizing action through planning and partnerships. And these are the key elements of map. One is that it has to be community owned, same thing. It builds on previous experiences and lessons, and that is the same thing as using data. It uses traditional strategic planning concepts, and that's what we're actually doing in this class. You're learning strategic planning. It focuses on creating the strength of the public health systems, and that's the same thing as building capacity. Um, we want to, in this one, we also wanted to address health leadership and the government, and we want to use services that already exist. So if, if there's a service in your community, you don't want to recreate it. You want to use what, it's, um, what already exists. And then the four assessments should drive the plan, and these are the four assessments. What are the community assets? What does the public system, health system have? What type of data analysis are there? And what changes would might occur? So those are the four assessments. And for people who like visuals, this is a visual of the map model. So just a summary, we've talked about, if you think back to um, Precede Proceed and the different places, in order to really look at your community, you need to look at these pieces of information. The quality of life, what is the quality of life for your population? Epidemiological data, what is the morbidity or sickness rates in your community? What are the mortality or illness rates in your community? What are the incidence and prevalence rates? Incidents are new cases, prevalence are um, total cases. So, you know, does your population or community have higher than national average of something that's important. Behavioral and environment review. People live within a community or within an environment and you need to look at the whole thing and not just the person. Um, you have to know what influences their behaviors and you have to involve your participants in planning. So that is the end of this lecture. We are now going to look at in a different slide presentation, we're going to look at some material in the lesson that you need to become familiar with before class. Thanks, and I'll see you in class.